when you have bad setups, it's often a result of bad preparation. Uh, not making your speech without be very, being very clear on how you're going to win the debate, what you're going to say. So on the other hand, on, in terms of good setups, um, setups can often win you the debate. You can, a good setup would often cast burdens on the other side, right from the start of your first speaker's speech. And therefore you would have probably have judges telling people that. Um, basically, you guys won because the other time, other team didn't really respond to the core analysis or the core um, principle that government or opposition has been arguing from the start of the debate. So it's very important that you become first very clear on how you're going to win the debate, and then try to work on how you uh, start off the, your first speech. So the, the second next speech. Um, in terms of setups, setups often include introductions, uh, models, and flagging uh, or signposting, if you like, the arguments that you're going to make. And let me start with introductions, how you should make your introductions. Um, if you start with a don't, that, oh, okay, by the way, this is the fourth page of the slide. Um, I often see younger members of the debate community making speeches um, like, so, which, which basically repeat the motion and claim it is an introduction. And um, the speaker starts off by saying that today we believe that abortion is something bad and therefore we should ban. That's not necessarily the most effective introduction. So I think it's better if you do something else. Another um, okay-ish, but not necessarily a good introduction um, so, if you just say that um, the harm of abortion is very important, it's um, it's amazingly large, it harms these people, and therefore we oppose. That's not necessarily perfect. Um, I think the better way to make that uh, into a, turn that into a better introduction uh, is to become more illustrative, or provide or when you provide examples. And I think the best part in this is to be comparative to other things. So you have to compare the harms of abortion to, for example, other alternative solutions, or how that's how a policy affects another person. It's important that you do this from the start of the debate, uh, because the first speech from the first speaker from either side is what remains in the mind judges the most. So that's why you have to be clear and provide the, the key concept in the introduction. And another thing I would say that you should do in an introduction uh, is to form a sentence that tells the judges why you win. This is a very hard part of debating or in any um, speeches. I would uh, explain a bit more about this later on. Oh, um, please do turn to the seventh page, uh, which explains more about what I mean by end by a sentence that tells the, the judges why you win. Has everybody got that? There's a page with, uh, with the title which says tips generally applicable to good setups and good cases. Okay, so why I'm telling you that ending by a sentence that tells you the judges why you win is important is because if you can do this, it also means that you are very clear on how you're going to win. And this is also a technique that can be applied in designing your speech, um, whether it is a constructive speech or a whip speech. So an example is on the right side of the slide. So if you have a motion, motion that says, this house would ban abortion in all stages of pregnancy. 
after making all their introductions and models or and making the points and things. I think it's important that you point to something like, so th this is what we believe in terms of in terms of government case. So opposition needs to prove why your right to convenience overwhelms the right to life of an unborn baby. And why I think this is important is because if you can come up this with this sentence, it means that you can break down what you need to prove in that speech. So saying that your right to convenience means that you know in your mind that the right of somebody that is affected by abortion is very small. And therefore, you can break that down and provide reasons to prove why that right is small. It can be because it it's only harms your um, access to some convenient goods, or it's because you consented to the harms in the first place. Also, um, it is clear that you have in mind that it is a right comparison, and the comparative, um, the right that is damaged on the other side is a right to life. So basically, um, you can, um, you have in your mind also that you have to prove that baby's right is important. And then you come up with reasons to tell you, tell us why babies' rights are important. And also, you know in mind that it is a comparison between life and other rights. And then you come up with other reasons to tell you, tell us why life is more important than other rights. So, in being in bringing up a comparative sentence that tells you people people how to win, you automatically know what you need to prove. Makes sense. Uh, this can also be used in, ter in terms of whip, whip speeches. Um, so, you, if you were a government whip, you can start off your whip speech by saying that opposition needs to prove why, why the lady's rights is more important than the baby's rights. So, that automatically brings your speeches into different uh, subcategories or sub-reasons to support that sentence. Like, my first point of WIP is going to be uh, about how your right to a convenient life is small. Second point, why we think that the baby's right is a large right that we have to care about. And thirdly, why if you compare the baby's right and the um, women's rights, the, the right to your life, should win over the lady rights. So it sounds easy, uh, but it's in fact it's very, very, very hard because it requires you to have a strategy in um, telling us how you're going to win, and also you have to be very concise on how you form a winning sentence, a comparison, uh, a very concise. A straightforward sentence to tell us why we win. <laughs> okay, um, let's go back to page five. I think it is. Uh, page five refers to how you make models. Okay, so when you make models, um, a, a problem I often see with many speakers is that it is physically tangled with the end of your introduction. So it's very important that you physically separate uh, the model part from the introduction part. And there are two ways to do this. One is to physically take a pause, uh, one or two seconds, and also, another way of doing this, with combination, in combination to pausing, um, you, you have a transit phrase. So you end up 
your introduction and say, what is a model? Or say, what we are going to do is this. And then continue with your model. Also, um, I think another reason why many people um, get fee feedback from judges on like models and setups is because people don't have examples. And it's very important that uh, you have at least three examples, especially when you're talking about something very uh, conceptual or if you're talking about something that is very unclear. Um, it's a very important that you provide three examples for everything. Uh, there are also tips to making good models or making um, or explaining models, which I explained on the right, right side of the, the slide. Um, if you have a case or a model that has many conditions, many addendums to explain, uh, the better way of explaining is to, is to not to to say everything as you as it comes up into your mind, but try to explain the outline first, and then provide the details. Uh, the example here would be this house would allow a corporal punishment, so you would allow you would allow teachers to hit children in order to make them behave better. Um, instead of saying that this house would, uh, so on government, children can be hit, our teachers must be very careful, they must be uh, whatever. We, it, it's big, it becomes very difficult for the judges to follow. So instead of doing that, it's better if you um, start with one sentence and then go to the details. Like, so in this debate, what we're going to do is to allow teachers to hit children when they deem necessary. This is going to be used as a last resort, and it is going to be directed by authorities of education to teachers to do it as a, as a last resort. We think this policy has a few conditions in, in the implementation. For example, teachers cannot hit children in front of other children. They must bring them to another room and explain why they have uh, no, they must bring them to another room in order to hit them. Secondly, the teachers must explain in verbal in, in words of why their behaviors are wrong, and then if they seem not to under, to listen to you, or if they repeat their deeds a few times, that also is that is the time when teachers can hit the children. Also, this hitting must be seen overseen by another teacher so that there is going to be some level of checks on whether the teachers um, would abuse this power or not. In every case, we think that the teachers should file a document reporting to the authorities on why they have hit it, the degree of the hitting that was um, enacted, and the response of children. This is like another, uh, this is one way I would start um, a model. So I'm not sure if I did it very well, uh, but I think I tried to put one issue in one sentence. I tried to make a pause in between different um, conditions. So this is one tip of how you um, make sure that the judge and the other team understands the model that you're debating on. Another tip here is to define a motion by telling examples of what you support and what you oppose. This, this is very important when it comes to a motion that says this house opposes something uh, or supports something because the line is very ambiguous. So. Um, I'm not sure if everybody has seen the video. Um, this is was in the semi-finals of World's University Debating Championship 2011, I think. There was a motion saying, this house opposes organized religions. So 
the, in this debate, the how the prime minister started off explaining the model was about was say that um, we are going to explain what we support and what we oppose. We oppose leadership. We oppose uh, hierarchy. So what that means is that we don't oppose people gathering around and trying to um, have some discussions on the interpretation of a certain text. What we do oppose instead is a person becoming a leader of that group or a person having a more authority over another person. That's an organized religion. So it becomes very clear that uh, the key feature of what an organized religion is, is leadership and hierarchy. Another thing um, I have seen is on a motion that says this house opposes the free movement of people in Africa. Um, if you want to argue, really come up with a detailed immigration policy, you can, but it's going to, be, to take time. So a better way of explaining it would be, for example, um, we oppose free visas, visa, visa free transports. So we are going to have harsher um, judging, judging quite, no, we are going to be harsher on judging whether somebody can, can be given a visa. Uh, we are going to have stronger border control um, and that kind of things. So basically the policy is to make sure that not many people can freely move across borders except for uh, the most elite people who are necessary for the development of the nation. A way of explaining this also would be that, but would be explaining that the opposite of the policy we support would be the free movement in Europe or EU type immigration policies. So this is another example of where um, explaining another thing that is opposite to what you support can help you define a motion or provide a model. Another thing I think people find difficult to explain uh, would be in narrative debates. In narrative debates, my advice was, would be providing examples of an actor doing something and how everybody else will respond to that. So say, let's say that in a world where life is unimportant, somebody doing this would be praised while somebody doing another, another thing will not be. Uh, this is a way of explaining a model in terms of trying to convey the right level of unimportance of life in the paradigm that you're supporting. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Right, um, the next page, which is about laggings and signposting. Um, the worst thing you can do in signposting would be repeating the motion. So, The motion is this house believed that X should Y. And then you say the first point is why X should Y. Uh, that's not the same posting. That's not breaking down what you're arguing. So the other thing to do, uh, other suggestions on what to do is to break down uh, the components of what you are arguing to form a story. So you can say, Again, in um, corporate punishment, you, you can say that uh, the effect on children, how children are going to behave well. Secondly, I'm going to explain why good behaviors of children are important for states and everybody else and for other people. Thirdly, 
why does the opposition's claim of something not to override the effect of on children? So it's very straightforward for anyone to listen. It's very clear what you, how you're going to win and what you're going to say. So when, when you try to say boast, I wouldn't advise people to say, uh, firstly, the analysis on the characteristic of children. Secondly, analysis on the characteristic of parents. That's not how you do it. Or how, how I would do it. That's not how I would do it. I would say um, that there is a strong story of why you need support emotion. And that is um, how emotion affects a certain group, why the state must care about it, or not the state, but why must people care about it, and why does the other side's analysis not overwrite that. <coughs> right. So, so far, um, I have given a couple of things that I always have in mind when I make debates, uh, make, make speeches. Uh, does anybody have any questions so far? Can I have a question? Yes, please. Eh,と, in any debate, will you make the storyline by flagging? Like, the more complicated, uh, uh, the debate requires more complicated crash or detailed science. Uh, capitalization like the economy or the um, big scale debate? Mm. Um, I would try to do uh, to prep on this line. Mm. So, especially when I'm doing first speeches. If I'm the first speaker, I'll try to form a story. So, an economy, more emotion. Um, なんだろうモーションが欲しいえー、っとうん<咳>フェイルアウトツービッグトゥーフェイルああ、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、そうですね、Is more principally based, actually. I think. I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> so,、uh, I would, in this case,、um, I would say, firstly,、uh, roughly the effect of big companies failing. Yeah. And then, secondly, I'm going to say why、um, this is something that requires. Government intervention into the free market. And then I probably wouldn't have another point, but in the second point of why government needs to intervene, I would ex explain two points.、Mm. Uh, firstly, that basically the effect is big, and、um, you can't really rely on like, the market. Dissolving or absorbing the massive unemployment that is going to be caused. So there is a pragmatic need to the policy. Yes. And secondly, I'm going to explain why we think this often、um, involves a market failure or something like that. So. When the market is not functioning,、um, government needs to do something, that kind of analysis. I haven't really got an argument for that yet, but that's probably how I'm going, I'm going to set up my speech.、Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, perfect. Everybody understands. All right.、Um, 
Let's move to the next page. Page six. No, eight, no, no, six. Oh no, uh, page six is done. And also, page seven is done. So page eight. Uh, page eight um, involves a few things that um, I would just like to tell people. So I often get questions on about first speeches or debate in general, or whether um, the first speaker should leave out key important facts so that the second speaker, often more experienced, can go into that and let's hope that the other side doesn't respond. Often I get questioned on whether that is a good approach, which I say no. Uh, my advice is to try to go as far as possible in the first speech. And all important issues must be explained from the first speaker and don't leave it to the second. Um, I would say that you should take it as, um, you should take it this way. Uh, so the mo more you leave things, the bigger risk you take, i.e. the less opportunity you have to defend your case. So this is very clear. So in an agent speech, you if you say everything from the first speaker, you at least have two other speakers to defend that case. If you say everything from the first speaker and from the second speaker, you only have one weak speaker to defend, uh, while they have two people, two speakers to destroy your case. So basically, if you use a, have. Um, if you know mathematics, um, two thirds is bigger than a half. So that's why I would always say that first speaker should say everything and don't leave everything. And you will notice if you look at good debates, uh, both internationally and uh, domestically, strong teams often complete things in the first speakers. Because that leaves more time for your second speaker and your third speaker to focus on the destruction of the other side case. And also, um, another emphasis, again, is about examples. Um, examples are very, very useful um, in making your, your case sound more relevant. So, this house opposes the restrictions on appearance in school. Um, if you're on the opposition, uh, saying that some, some restrictions are needed, instead of saying that some example, uh, some restrictions are needed, or some restrictions regarding safety of children are necessary, or saying some restriction regarding the emotional psycho uh, the psychological security of children are important um, it's better to just give m many examples of what what you mean by it so in terms of security um, you shouldn't um, oh no. In terms of safety, you shouldn't um, come to schools in sandals because sandals are less safe compared to other shoes. In, in terms of like um, your physical security, other things would be you can't really fatigue yourself. Because you are likely, because that's likely more likely to be irreversible. In terms of um, other restrictions, in terms of how you should care about other children, you can say um, you shouldn't wear Nazi military uniforms, even though if you think it's cool. I think these are more um, better ways to give a direct explanation on the standards 
of what you are going to oppose or, or no, no it's the standards of the restriction that you're going to introduce okay so that's about seven pages of um general tips or general ideas on what you should do and shouldn't do um i think it's important that we move to the next page and move into the examples and um, real case studies so in, the motion says that this house would provide additional benefits to families on welfare according to their children's performance in school. The next page and next next page um, has an example of an introduction that I would make in the speech. Uh, it seems a little bit long, but um, anyway. Um, is that is everybody on the on this page on page uh, what is it page ten? So if I'm given the motion, um, I would give. I, an I would do an introduction, um, provide a model, and also set up the speech in this way. It's going to be like, on government, we stand for ending the circle of poverty that leads to the endless rich production of poor families. We're talking about clear the positive correlation between family income and education, and also education and future income of the child. We're talking about children having no incentive to study harder because simply they have no idea that studying leads to better outcomes. We're talking about children choosing to start working at 16 simply because it is what their parents, friends, and their entire neighborhood has done in the past, and they have seen that. So we propose today to stop this by providing an additional incentive that is very uniquely appealing to especially for the poor households. So this is what we're going to do. In liberal democracies, we will have annual revisions on the amount of welfare provided to families now living on welfare. If their children perform well in school, welfare will substantially increase. This performance will be mainly judged in academic subjects and with a little bit of um, maybe, if you like, arts or uh, PE or whatever. This policy is, is important to notice that this is not to decrease the welfare of families with poorly performing kids. So this is going to be a bonus on children, on children to work hard and get results. Next page. We think this policy is effective and it best serves the principle of welfare as a safety net. So opposition will have to prove to us that there is a larger interest in keeping poor families poor for generations and continue to burden the state and everybody's tax money. And this is something we think is quite ridiculous. We think our policy best serves the interests of the poor, the rich, and everybody in society, and therefore we propose. The first thing I'm going to tell you is why this bonus works as a motivation for children to study harder. Second thing, well, I'm going to tell you why this policy best serves the principle of safety net provided by the state. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about how this policy affects, has an effect on decreasing the state's budget, therefore decreasing the number of, uh, no, no, Decreasing the state's budget, uh, decreasing the no no, uh, decreasing the burden on the state's budget by decreasing the number of poor families. Okay, so that was about two minutes. Um, let me explain why I think this ex this introduction is not bad. Um, I think the first part it was very concise. It has a very simple, clear identification of the problem, which was the reproduction of fam poor families living on welfare. Also, it has examples in which uh, examples support the problem. It was all about how. Um, Poor families tend to not have children studying hard. And that leads to another reproduction of poor, fam poor families. So, in terms of explaining the model, I had 
a transition transition sentence saying so this is what we're going to do the first the first sentence was i think was clear um, that in liberal democracies, we would have annual revisions on the amount of welfare provided to families which are now living on their welfare, welfare. That is straightforward. And then you are going into the conditions or the details. So it's going to be about um, academic subjects. It's going to be um, children performing well in school, getting more money. And also to remind people that this is not a policy that decreases the welfare of other children people who are having not smart kids. Okay. In terms of ending how I end this uh, introduction, the technique here was to say what opposition needs to prove. So opposition needs to provide a reason in why they think that keeping poor families poor for another few generations is an important thing that we must protect. And that's going to be hard. So I think in this, in this motion, opposition would try to uh, defend some other rights or provide another solution. But at least if they can't do that, the judges have in mind that opposition didn't really respond to the core principle or core, um, core problem of the government. Another thing was to have a little touch on the principle of welfare. So the principle of welfare as the safety net is about um, it's going to be the key part of the leader's speech because that principle is going to be about why we think that in the society that we live in, the capitalist society that we live in, uh, we encourage people to make economic challenges, but to work harder, to get more money. But when? Because the market can fail somebody. No, the market can fail somebody. If they fail, they have safety nets so that they at least don't have to die, as so that they can um, live for a, few, uh, for a certain time and then work again to get more money. So that, that is the, safe, the point of the safety net. So instead of saying that, so the core part of this government's case is to not say that welfare is something that everybody deserves in the first place. Because if everybody can say, if the opposition says that everybody should be entitled to a certain amount of money, um, that weakens your principle. By saying that this is uh, this safety net, well, being on welfare, like election, is only there to make people a productive force again. Uh, if you prove that principle, it makes the case stronger and it gives more principal importance to the argument that you can't keep people poor. Right, I hope that makes sense.